So welcome. Um, my name is Roger Berkowitz um, from the Hannah Arendt Center at Bard College, and I'm thrilled to be here um, with Lorato Shadi. Welcome, Lorato. Thank you for having me, Roger. Uh, it's a pleasure, and I, I really uh, thank the the Richard Saltoon Gallery for uh, organizing this yeah. this event uh, on Hannah Arendt, a, a great year long exhibition on Hannah Arendt, and. Um, Thrilled to be talking to you. Uh, you're, you have a couple of works included in, in the exhibition. And um, when we talked briefly a, a week or so ago, um, I asked you if you had read much Hannah Arendt before this exhibition, and you said not much. Tell me just a little bit about what you what you knew about her and, and what, you know, when you're asked to be in an exhibit on Hannah Arendt, what that meant. Um. <laughs> I was, I was actually thinking about it this morning that I think what I knew about Hannah Arendt was possibly a form of erasure in how um, when we think of Martin, Martin Luther King, you think, oh, the guy who had a dream, uh, Nelson Mandela, oh, the guy who went to prison for 27 years, Hannah Arendt, oh, the banality of evil person. <laughs> so <laughs> it, it was in a way a, a little bit of that. I mean, of course I kind of knew that the banality of evil um, writing came from her, uh, from, from the, the trial of one of the- Adolf Eichmann, one of yeah. the- I don't know his name. This is pa paper pushing uh, the- the, yeah, he was he was the head of the the sort of the the uh, transport division and the and the ex and the and the and the deportations for uh, uh, the Nazi uh, the Nazi regime. Yeah. Um, and, and Adolf he, Eichmann. Yeah. What's Edmund like the person Eichmann. who dealt? Uh, yeah. Not, not Eichmann, like Edmund, the person who who uh, who dealt with the paper. And uh, I also knew, uh, you know, that. Uh, that she's um, a Jewish lady who had to become a refugee in the US. Uh, so I didn't really know much besides that. And I think I have to say that I still don't think I know a lot because there's a lot to know. <laughs> so, so now it feels a little bit like I'm, um, I, it feel, how, how does it feel? It feels like, it feels like maybe she's a puzzle that's coming together in, in little pieces. Um, I don't entirely have a whole picture of her, but I have more than I had um, before. And there's a little, um, yeah, yeah. So you 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 got asked to be in this exhib exhibit. Um, it, it's based on her book uh, "Between Past and Future," um, and you're you're in this this uh, exhibition on on the essay "What Is Authority," um, which is a difficult essay. Um, and I, you know I know you've tried to you've looked at it and read it. Um, you know what's your what's your what's your approach? What what do you what do you what do you think the essay is about or what is it, how does it speak to you? Wow, can you ask a simpler question? That's yeah. it. No. Yeah, I'll ask a simpler question. No, no, it's fine. I'll get to it. Uh. <laughs> it's just, <laughs> I'm just letting you know that I know that that's not the easiest. No, but um, what was nice with um, the, the whole Richard Saltoon process and me being, I think, what is authority is the fourth chapter because the gap was not a chapter, but the prologue. So that kind of gave me time to sit in on the other discussions. And even though the book itself is not very easy, at least there's a sense of getting a little bit of a, um, of a feel for it. And then I just kind of listened to a few things and read like a couple of things um, here and there. And now with what is authority, I'm not too sure I still get it. I think I have a lot of questions 
But I also think that a lot of my questions don't necessarily have to do with Hannah Arendt herself and that they have to do with the practice of Western philosophy um, per se in that also reading this because she she also does a lot of of um, of unpacking history, like situating herself within a history of Western philosophy, talking a lot about Socrates and uh, Plato and towards the end of this chapter, Machiavelli. So there's a lot of, of like um, doing that, which is great, but for someone who is not very, well versed in Western philosophy, it's quite interesting. And also reading this and going through this process, it reminded me when I was in my early twenties and I decided that I needed to, <laughs> I did, I guess a lot of people do this. I, I decided I need to get up to speed with Western philosophy. I'm like, oh, what's this thing? So let's buy a book, uh, beginnings of philosophy. <laughs> And um, I, that's when I found out about, I think therefore I am uh, of Ren Rene. Rene Descartes? Or? Yes. Yeah. And I also remember that reading that I very much had the feeling of the context being about a space and time that I don't necessarily relate to. So for me, I'm very much aware of, of that Western philosophy. For example, the question of what is authority or what was authority is very much situated within Western philosophy. And when I read it, I'm aware that it's Western philosophy and doesn't have the, um, the other ideas of philosophy. So for me, I'm thinking, huh, what would, how would, and an African philosopher asked the question or what question would they have? Um, because then they would be situated within a context that's not uh, Western philosophy or towards the end when she talks about the American revolution and, and kind of the idea that, what did she say, let me see make some notes, not very good notes, <laughs> but some of them, the experience of revolution and the idea that there was no violence so that the violence that was there was, was only within the context of war. It's, let me see. It's on page 140 uh, of, yes. you know, of these attempts, only one, the American revolution has been successful. The founding fathers, as characteristically enough, we still call them, founded a completely new body politic without violence and with the help of a constitution. And then later on, she, she, um, she speaks also about, uh, she clarifies on that. Right. Violence was more or less restricted to regular warfare. Yes, yes, that, that thing, like violence restricted to, um, to regular warfare. And I remember just also then wondering about this, because then the whole essay comes back to um, the ideas of revolution. And one, the uh, it's a bunch of things which I, I would like you to, to tell me more what you think about them. Because <laughs> the, she also makes a, a distinction between French Revolution and American Revolution and the she makes the distinction that the American was like was more successful than the French Revolution, and makes a distinction between the ideas and what happens later on and reality. So then it it gets really complex because also I think that she would agree that what's happening now within the Americas is maybe not necessarily what she was talking about when she spoke about. Um, the American Revolution being um, successful. And when, when I read the ideas of revolution towards the end, 
connecting it with America, I was also thinking about the storming of the Capitol and people keep saying they are they're enacting, uh, you know, it's a revolution. Um, Let me pick up on, on one thing you said, which is that you read it and you were sort of trying to find the space within this sort of Western philosophy that she was talking about. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you, you said something to me in another conversation we had that, um, that what you, one of the things you liked about Arendt is that she doesn't situate herself in sort of a universal time. Yeah. Um, that, uh, um, you know, she's, you know, the, the whole, there's a, there's a sort of way in which what you're sort of describing is this essay is written at a time in which Western philosophy has broken. Um, and yeah. so she's writing amidst what she calls the pillars or the shards or the break of a tradition. And so even though she turns back to the tradition, she doesn't see the tradition as having a continuity over her. And there's this open space. Uh, and in many ways, I mean, as she says in the first sentence, this essay should better be called what was authority than what is authority, because there is no more authority. And I think part of what you were referring to is that sort of living in a broken time, I think. Maybe you can talk a little bit about, you know, that experience in reading it or your thoughts on that? So also as you were talking about how she situates herself, what I find really interesting, um, I, again, picking up the, she doesn't, uh, she doesn't speak from a space of universality. And for me, Western philosophy, one of the things that has made it super alienating for me is that I, I see heterosexual middle-class white-bodied men, uh, able-bodied white men writing um, and, and setting the tone for the West that then becomes the tone that, that is kind of imposed to everyone which is like also, um, also me. And what I find interesting and what I think makes Hannah Arendt so powerful for me is that she's a woman and she is also from uh, uh, a minority or um, a group of people that have been, you know, uh, violence has been enacted on them so at some point she's been on the bottom of the scale and she understands that and what I also find interesting and uh, is that which also makes sense with how she she takes all this history that's very like I said white male able body very narrow and particular way of thinking she takes all that and being a woman and going through having a partner who then becomes a Nazi supporter and then going through this experience of uh, having to flee her own country and become a refugee and go into America, really that life experience, I see how, or I appreciate how that informs and influences her really uh, wonderfully and and I kind of think of her and put her in in a similar way with people like Foucault who was still a, a middle-class white man but he was gay and that informs a lot of his thinking or then you have Simone de Beauvoir who her being a female and uh, having a misogynist as a partner also informs so all those become interesting for me and I think that those life experiences come in and yeah and and in terms of a broken time I think that also because people who are in precarious situations or people who are not in the dominant, the, I don't know, um, who, who don't hold dominant power. 
when when we're talking about a a, a a broken time, it's also like when, how do I say this? Let's say, for example, if if you're talking about there's there's this running joke in in American pop television where a white friend would ask a black friend, if you could go back to any place in the past, which time would you go to? And the black friend is like, none. <laughs> That's so, good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, I, I think I just think it's really important for us to just recognize what you said. I mean, if you think about the people who are in the pantheon of Western literature and philosophy, or certainly philosophy or political thinking, I mean, the fact that Arendt was in a concentration camp, that she was arrested, that she escaped, that she was a refugee, that most of her friends were killed in, a, yeah. in the Holocaust, um, that she was a stateless person for 17 years, not to mention that she's a woman and a Jew. Um, I mean, it really is is unique in 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 sort of that that pantheon, and um, and it does give her her work a, a different a different feeling. Although what's also, I think, so hard for people to take is that her work is so distanced and not emotional in its writing. And that's one of the things that actually bothered people about her, especially in books like Eichmann in Jerusalem, where people ob objected to sort of the dispassionate um, tone of the book um, and wanted her to be more angry or, or emotional or, or things like that. And and she never went in that direction. It's one of the, um, it's one of the sort of, uh, you know, really fascinating characteristics of her work that on the one hand, she writes from this incredibly powerful experience. And yet her writing is very um, impartial and, and dispassionate. But that makes sense to me. Um, yeah. An example is that, because at the beginning I gave the example of her, um, Martin Luther King and Nelson Mandela. The thing that a lot of people are surprised with Nelson Mandela is that he comes out of prison for 27 years and he doesn't want revenge. Right. And, and they're like, but you should be, you should act this way. But if you even look at the United States right now, you have a lot of people um, who have been wrongfully imprisoned or who have gotten a kind of, um, especially black people who get sentences that are completely unfair, they come out of prison and they don't come out angry. They're like, I, I actually just wanna live my freedom. And so for me, that, that doesn't surprise me. And you hear it a lot actually with the Black Lives Matter movement. I'm gonna misquote it, but it says something like, um, you're lucky that we don't want revenge. We just want justice. Um, so, so the idea that she wasn't angry or emotional makes sense. It's also that it's expected or, or whiteness and maleness or patriarchy or whatever says that women have to be emotional. There's also parts of that, that um, you're not living up to the ideals of, of these, this womanness. Or, so. I don't know. For me, it makes sense that oh, no. she would. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, I, 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 and I think it's one of the things that gives her voice so much power. Um, but it, it was something she was highly criticized for at the time. But the question um, is who was criticizing her? Mostly white men and mostly interesting. In this case, it was, it was um, mostly Jews um, who were upset with the way she portrayed Eichmann and Jews in her book, Eichmann in Jerusalem, um, the Jewish establishment. So um, that's but also who... you just said something really interesting. You said the Jewish ex establishment. Yeah. So, cause there is the difference between uh, people of the Jewish faith and a Jewish establishment. Oh, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, she was, I mean, many, many Jews all over the world really loved what she wrote and she got you know, an enormous amount of positive feedback, but the establishment um, rejected it because they, they thought it, 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 it didn't 
fit with their narrative of 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 what of how to portray Jews during the war as victims and not always and she was and while she thought they were victims they she also thought that many of them acted badly and she talked about it and they didn't like that um and that so it also makes sense because authority or establishment doesn't like new ones you can't function it doesn't function really well in uh, in new ones That's things right. need to be broken down really clearly so that it can be easily force fed to people. That's right. So at the end of this essay, this, this really wonderful essay, and when she's talking about break of tradition and the loss, you know, and, and how there is no authority. And as you said, she, she turns to revolution to sort of ask this question of, can we reestablish authority in some way? Can we refound it? And, and she ends it by saying that what we really you know, to live in a world of brokenness, a world like we live in now, we have to sort of learn again um, to, to live without authority and, um, and to live without a sacred trust in religion or, or any, any, any higher powers and without the protection of tradition and self-evident standards. And she ends it by saying we have to learn to live um, amongst the elementary problems of human living together. And, um, you know, that, that is really what almost all of Hannah Arendt's work is about, right? In this break, after the end of tradition, how are we going to learn to be a people together? What does it mean to come together? And that really strikes me as a lot of what your your work, I want to turn a little bit, use this as a turning point, uh, is about, um, you know, one of the, one of your main works, at least in this exhibit, is called We the People. Um, and I think it raises this question of who are the people? What is, who are we as the people? How do we become the people? So maybe, you know, A, does the Arendtian question speak to you and how does your work frame that question um i guess yeah of course the Indian question speaks to me um the only thing with oh i should come back to the work it's just that when you were talking about how to get back it's um i'm I'm certain this is not how she means it, but because I live within contemporary time and I consume contemporary uh, uh, information and media, it keeps making me think of uh, make America great again. Like the idea of this past where there was greatness within, within that past. And for me, it's always for who? Um, who who is speaking? Did everybody really have greatness within um, within that past? And I'm not too sure what authority is, and I'm not too sure if if I am for authority. But I'm also don't I don't think I'm against authority. I'm just for. I think that if we're talking about that, then we need to have a more complete image. So if I go back to the analogy of Hannah Arendt as, as a puzzle and saying that I'm, I, I had a few pieces, now I have a few more pieces, but I, I still don't have the full image. I feel like if we're talking about these kind of questions, then you need to have as many pieces of the puzzle as possible. And if you only have Western philosophy within that puzzle, then you have what I had at the beginning, which is like banality of evil, full stop. So you need to include as many more pieces. And that becomes tricky because then it makes things complex. And, and complexity um, power some, seems to not know what to do with complexity. Our power seems to not know what to do with, uh, with diversity, you know. We seem to, to be like, okay, we have male and female, full stop. We have right and left. We have 
black and white and everything else in between doesn't exist or has to be boxed in to one of those two categories. And I think that if we're gonna talk about authority or find it or find our way, we need to have as many of those um, voices as possible, at least acknowledged. And, and I think, yeah, in terms of are we the people, I was sort of, I guess, questioning that in the same way that Hannah Arendt is asking about authority. Like, yeah. For, for example, she was a refugee. So in We the People, in, in, in the work by Tobame, the Are We the People one, the American Constitution, uh, the preamble is We the People. The South African constitution, also the preamble is we, the people of South Africa, ta -da -da -da, agree that South Africa belongs to all who live in it. But we have refugees who live in South Africa who South Africa doesn't belong to them. So then who is we the people in, in the we the people of South Africa belong, agree that it, it belongs to all who live in it. But legally, it doesn't belong to, to everybody who lives in it. And that is a legal, that is also a legal document. And the, the title is Batobame, which, which means my people, which is taken from political speeches and how politicians um, speak to the people and frame conversations. So I don't necessarily have answers, but I do have questions and I think that I do value different voices and I value being um, challenged. And I, and I value the moments when my narrow box gets literally like blown up. Uh, Cause, and, and, and I really kind of, kind of like that. It's uncomfortable. Yeah. And, and it's super scary. Um, but once you move past that, it's, yeah. Well, actually, I don't think I've moved past that either. <laughs> I'm still working through. <laughs> well, it's just that I'm thinking that. of a particular incident where <laughs> that box was being blown up. <laughs> well, I, want to, I want to hear about that incident. Um, I, I was, I was, okay, so it was about, I was educating myself about transgender people. So I went online and found a, a YouTube where you had, I think, three different transgender people talking. And I remember, maybe it was three or five, I, for, I forget. But I thought that I kind of had a sense of what was happening. And then when I watched it, one person was saying, I want to be called they. One person was saying, I want to be called she. And one person was saying, I want to be called he. One person was saying, I, they were all saying different things. And I remember having to stop the video because I was like, oh my God, I don't know anything. I, I like, I thought, I thought I knew something. But I don't because we're dealing with individuals. And of course, it makes sense what they're saying. And then also understanding that, oh, I thought I was, um, I thought I was at a certain point, but now I realize that there's so much more unlearning and relearning I have to go through. And I had to like ask myself a couple of questions. And then I think a day later, I went back to the video because I also wanted to respect that moment. I didn't want to just watch it and not listen, but I wanted to respect what I was feeling. I wanted to, yeah, I wanted to pause and deal with it and deal with the fact that this is having an effect on me and ask myself why it shouldn't. And so that was, yeah, for me personally, that was a beautiful moment. And 
constantly in, in conversations. I, I try to keep myself in check. But I also think that that is a beautiful thing because my puzzle or my world becomes fuller. I can feel it being more fuller. I, the more I engage with, I, with those ideas, and the more I open myself up, I understand how, how richer I, as, as a personal experience, it becomes. And it's not even about the other person. It's like about me. So, yeah. I mean, that's, I think you've, I mean, I think in, in what we've just talked about, you've, you've, you've really expanded my view of, of the question you ask, are we the people? Um, you know, uh, we talked a little bit about whether this was a political work uh, when we talked last time. And, you know, in some sense, it must be, you, you know, you, 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 you referenced the, the, the preambles to all these constitutions. And yet, when you talk about the YouTube video, are we the people? Who are the people? And how do we think about all the different people, the refugees, transgender, minorities here, there, I'm wondering, you know, I mean, I think the answer must be that it's, it speaks both to a political question and sort of a state like South Africa or the United States, but it also speaks to that more existential question, who is a person, what is a person? Um, we, where did it come out of this question for you? Are we the people? And how has it expanded? I mean, maybe this is what we're already talking about, but you know, it just seems like such a enormous question. Oh, what? Well, I don't know. It came from, came from life. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it did. I think it came from life and just being in this space and living. I, I remember the moment. It's, it's always weird because I think it just came from from being in the world and reading and listening and just looking at conversations and looking at how we we tend to divide ourselves and you're right it's it's both it's both a political question and I guess an existential question or a personal um, question um, Yeah. Oh, I feel like you want me to philosophize right now. I don't want you to philosophize. The, the artwork is philosophizing for you, me. You told me. You told me also, Lorato, at one point that you think not in language but in images. Yeah. And yeah. Yet, and yeah. Here's this incredibly powerful work that you've created. That, at least, because I'm a linguistic person, not an image person, is dominated by a a, a sentence or a question. I'm wondering how you see it. Is it an image or is it a language? This this artwork that you've, or is it a, you know, is it what? How did how did what is the image that you have? Or I mean, I see it. It's it's a red background with yellow and and black letters, um, and it's powerful. Um, is it does it strike you as strange that one of your, you know, one of these artworks that you've made is so language based? No, because I've done a couple of language-based stuff. So. Yeah, no, I know. Okay. <laughs> uh, but I think to answer your question, I see it, I guess, in an emotive way. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think part of it come from this, which is also maybe why it's a little bit tricky for me to answer your question, because there is a lot of me thinking with my emotions maybe a best a good example is that I just told you now that I was watching a YouTube video and then I paused it to pay attention to what it is that I I was fe feeling the physical reaction that I was having so a lot of the times I don't think I I can even say that I try to pay attention to what I'm feeling but is that my gut, which is not necessarily a feeling per se, my, 
oh, how do I say? In making work, I feel like I have two thinking brains. I have the gut thinking brain and I have this thinking brain. And it's a constant balance between the two because this thinking brain is also another way for me to translate or clarify to the audience mm. or pose the question but the gut also has has a brain of its own i'm sure there's things that have been written about the gut brain that i can't reference right now uh, i think absolutely um and the, one of the other works in the exhibit, which you have no, don't have a title for yet, um, is uh, sort of a, a weaving, I think, right, um, yeah. of, 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 of very vibrant red wool. Yeah. Um, uh, and, I, I, um, and there's sort of a, I don't know, a impression in the middle, depression in the middle. Um, and you said that it's like weaving you into this. Yeah, it it strikes me that this is engaged in the same question of we are we the people? Am I the people? What is the people? Where do I belong? Is that um, uh, on a much more abstract level? Um, you want to talk a little bit about this work? Yeah, um, I think it connects really nicely to what I was just saying now about the gut and the brain thinking, because, for example, in making the works, they're very much connected to my performative practice because with my performative practice, um, it's also weird calling it a performative practice because it's not really, I also sometimes think I don't even know what performance is because sometimes well, the classic ideas of performance, I think are quite in, inadequate in framing what it is that I do because what I do is very much situated within everyday life like I remember I keep remembering the first time I went to a gallery opening by myself I was the only black person there who wasn't holding a service tray and that was a performance for me because instantly I, I recognized that as much as the works on the wall were on display me being that anomaly was also on on display so and then going to a lot of openings and being the only black person around or uh you know uh people who are who are constantly in a space of minority would understand uh, what i'm talking about so that all that gets moved on to um the performance practice as well. So now with these works, what I do is I met it. Some of them take like two, two to three weeks to make. So for that two to three weeks, I have a rigid schedule for making them. For example, I wake up, meditate, journal, uh, then knit from one time to the next and then a break, and then I net in the evening until 10, then I go to sleep, then I go to bed, and I keep that rhythm. And talking about the, the gut, the gut brain, what I do is that I fast. Or, so the first week is a water fast. And then after that, it's, um, I introduce foods, but I don't drink alcohol. I don't do I forget, I will, I'm going to do it now and then I'll go through the schedule properly. Um, so that while I'm knitting, because I listen to radio and I watch um, movies and stuff to distract myself, it's very important that my body is present, that my gut is present. So if it's not full, it's not overly working. So um, my body is fully there. I allow my mind to kind of sleep a little because I also realize that I can't listen to philosophy while 
I'm <laughs> half hungry. I tried. <laughs> I had some really good books. I was like, woo, I have all this time. I'm going to listen to that. And then I realized, no, I'm hungry. <laughs> My body's working. <laughs> I need Bridget Jones's diary <laughs> where <laughs> I can zone out. <laughs> oh, I love it. But but then my 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 physicality is is present. My body is is like really present within that space. And also because I need my mind as well to count the stitches, to pay attention to what it is that I'm doing. So I'm really concentrated. Um I forgot. I think I'm not sure <laughs> your question. Oh, well, this is this is fascinating. Um, I mean, I love. I, first of all, I love this this sort of opposite this 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 unity that you've sketched, but unity and diversity of the gut brain and the whatever the other brain is. Um, um, and 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 so it it seems like these works come out of a kind of de, de, uh, you you deprive yourself of food and and. Are you, you know, I don't know if you, I mean, are you, you're meditating. Um, do you find you get to, uh, is it, is the idea to get to another level or is it to just live amidst this, um, to, you know, being deprived and this deprivation? I, I really, I really don't see it as deprivation. For example, um, I did, I've done a couple of, a lot of my works seem like depriving there's a there's a 60 hour piece i did which is 10 days uh and every day i sit and crochet from 10 a.m to to 4 p.m i think without a single break no eating no toilet breaks nothing <clears throat> and i do that for 10 days and when i was thinking of doing that i wasn't thinking oh i'm gonna deprive myself but I, and I think because one of the reasons why I don't think of it as depriving myself is that I, it is connected to labor practices. And there are times when I look at the white cube space of a gallery of, of gallery spaces as spaces of privilege and exclusion. And I'm, and sometimes these, especially that one, Mosako Wanako, the, the 60 hour, performance one is one can see it as a meditation on um, the silent labor that makes privilege possible so I don't think I don't think it's depriving because I think you have in South Africa you have mine workers that are doing deadly work that got killed because they were asking for less than a minimum wage. You, in the US, you have people who are packing chicken who have to pee in a box uh, because they don't have a break. Amazon workers have horrible working conditions. So it's like, and what I'm doing is by choice. So sometimes I feel like it's comparing fasting to starving. They're not the same. And is the weaving and knitting because you love weaving and knitting? Is it a, I mean, I, you know, I, I, it's, it seems so clear to me that it's about knitting a people together or knitting myself into a story or something, but I'm just wondering, you know, how you came to knitting in this, in these works. I think through different um, strategies and you're completely right. It's about, um, is one of the reasons why I use a crochet is that I do draw parallels between the pen because crochet is one needle. And uh, with the works that will be at uh, Richard Saltoon um, and the 60 hour performance I'm talking about, I really am writing myself within, uh, within this fabric and imbuing it with, um, with meaning. How I came to it, is through different avenues. Um, I also I also use it the same way I think of it as a canvas as well. And I'm also 
because it's been very much connected to um, um, labor that's not celebrated or unrecognized labor, I deliberately choose very simple and basic patterns. It's not something where you have um, extravagant patterns within it where you, or, or, or a lot of colors in it, because that work is, is valid. It's just that in this case, I'm doing something quite uh, different. And how I came to it at the very beginning was I didn't have money. And it was a really cheap option. Right. And then at some point, I used it because in one of the earliest performances, I know that I wanted to spend a big amount of time on something where that required time, because it was also about, about time, um, about counting time, about, uh, about quanti quantifying it. There's another work I did, which is hammer, where for six hours, I breathe out only in, in balloons. So it's like, and, and, and I don't breathe out into the space. And I was also interested with that work, with the idea that there's only one person who can, um, who can monitor. It's not the best word, but there's no way for me to prove to anyone else that I literally only blew out into balloons. There's a form of integrity that comes with doing what I say that I'm gonna do. And I was so insistent with it. One balloon blew up in my face and I was like, oh my God, did I breathe out into the space? <laughs> I freaked out. I'm like, Is, does that count as breathing out into the space? <laughs> so, um, but it is a work about counting time. At the end, what you get is a five minute video. So you have six hours that are compressed into five minute video, also talking about an artist's work and how you spend time. I forgot to mention that this performance happens in an office space. So you have me and people in an office space also um, working. So you have those two juxtapositions of an artist at work and also uh, people um, at work. I'm just, I, 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 this is a question that is a, is a genuine question because I'm just interested. So much of your work seems concerned with, intrigued by the question of time, of duration. And I'm trying to figure out in my own head where that comes from for you. What is, what is the, why, why is this question of time and duration and meditation so um, important or, or interesting or exciting for you? I'm drawing a blank. I'm trying to, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, good question. Why is it interesting? Where does it come from? It's almost, it feels a little bit like, why do I eat? Mm. Or why do I get hungry? It's just, yeah. I'd have to, let me think about it. I'm not too sure how to answer that. It's a really good question. So let me think about it. We have time. <laughs> <laughs> let me ask the next question no. and, then, okay. and then that will come up. <laughs> so one, one of the, one of the, you know, your, your, another work that doesn't seem about time is, is your work with, the fists, you know, what is yeah. a fist uh, or, or what is a... Um, I know, it's called, I know what a closed fist means. Right. Where, and that seems, first of all, it's, it's, it's interesting you chose, at least in the ones I have, a white fist, at least is what no, it's... No, it's not. No, it's not. I, maybe it's a bad image that I have. I no, apologize. it's not a bad image. It's one of the things that I like about that work. Uh, okay, it's so nice. talk to me about it. It's my fist. The interesting thing is that black people know it's a black fist, 
white people are not so sure. You're not the first one. When it was first installed in Hamburg, um, the, the, the guys that were installing it were having an argument as to, no, no, that's a white, that's a white person. And it's like, no, it's not. No, no, it is. So yeah, but it's, it's, I don't think it's necessarily important that you know which fist it is because also the work is the, the thumb in, in different mm -hmm. positions. And, and a lot of it has to do with the success of it, the success of reading it comes when the audience owns their own perspective. My favorite to use as an example is this. So um, in South Africa, this is not good. This is a crude word. But I was in Brazil and they told me that this means good luck. But I also know that this in um, some Western spaces is the, uh, I got your nose, um, child game. I don't know if you know it. Yes, I got your nose. I played it many times. <laughs> See? <laughs> and in in reading, let's say, that fist, I like the idea that you could have five different people from five different places in the world who have five different lived experiences, who get five different things from it. And in having that conversation with each other, the work becomes more and fuller and they also become fuller in their own experiences and like no for me it means this really no for me it means this um and and i think one could say there is similarities to it with are we the people because there is a sense of questioning our assumptions in a way talked earlier about opening the box, right? Watching the YouTube video about transgender and sort of stopping and seeing how different cultures and different fists, same fist in different cultures mean different things. It, it's a way of, it's a way of sort of pulling ourselves out of our limited perspective, pulling ourselves into a global world. Um, you know, you, you, you're, it seems like that's a lot of what your work is. Are we the people? Who is the people? What is the people? How do we knit ourselves together? Um, I'm, I'm still interested in the question of time, but I, I'll, I'm going to give you a pass on that. <laughs> yeah. I think it's a good question. I'm not too sure how, how to answer it. Yeah. Because I think it's, because it runs through all, all the works in, yeah. in a way, even the fist, which doesn't seem to, which doesn't, um, immediately have time in your face, um, but has that because you require a certain amount of time to do this kind of introspection. And, and it's basically, what's also nice about the fist is that it's very possible to, maybe it's very possible to, because they're also huge, they're from floor to ceiling and, oh, wow. uh, the the they're from floor to ceiling but they're not put on the wall they're put on a board so then they become um structural elements or sculptural elements and they they tower over um over the individual and it's possible to come in oh one of the things is that the way that i place them is that the first one you see is this one. Which uh, one? This one. Mm -hmm. It's generally this one. Because then I'm hoping, which has happened a few times, is that people immediately think of this, which is the power fist. Mm -hmm. They're like, oh, it's possible to look at it and go, ah, oh, it's the power fist four times. And it's also possible to look at it and go, there's something wrong with that. It's, um, and then 
when you start looking, you go, oh no. Um, so even in looking at this work, you need, the more you spend time with the work, the more the work opens up um, to you. The more you start asking questions. So a lot of my work is also about creating that space for the viewer as well. Because let's say 60 hours or six days of doing nothing but knitting, there's nothing to see. It's just somebody sitting and knitting. And maybe if you come back six times in a row, this thing gets longer and longer. But if you give the work time, then it, time meaning in your head, within yourself, then it opens up to you. Then maybe you look at the carpet and you see that the, or the river or the scroll, and you see that the patterns have been changed. Because what I do when I'm sitting there for those 60 hours or six hours a day is that I try to pay attention to what's going on in my head and in my body. And I try to mimic that as I inscribe myself consciously onto, onto this wrong, long river scroll thingy. You see how articulate I am? Thingy. Very. Very <laughs> um, and then it gives you a chance, which a lot of people have done, which I love, where they just sit with the work and they just watch. And I think when people do that, it opens up. But I've also seen people who don't look at the work, who, who look at it and go, I know what it is, I've seen it. It's, uh, you know, I mean, it's, I'm sure you have go to museums and, you know, they're so crowded and it's almost impossible to look at works in a museum these days um, because you're in this crowd moving around. And um, I've had the pleasure at times to be in almost empty museums and just sit for hours looking at certain works. And those are some of the most memorable artistic or aesthetic experiences I've had but it's just so rare that we have them. Um, yeah, and the work, which is, I think goes back to your time question, is that a lot of my works challenge the audience to, to take that time. Sometimes I have also another video, it's seven hours long, where I'm sitting on a plinth and knitting. And this time I was using two knitting needles and I'm knitting a long string that's it for seven hours you don't see anything that's it sometimes i used to call it forcing people to watch paint dry <laughs> and eric is like don't say that <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes i think of it as watching it uh, an hourglass because what I was also interested in is the idea that how we look at video works, I've created videos that are five to 10 minutes long. I know that you come in, you see it, you wait for the moment that you last saw to complete the circle. And then you're like, okay, I can move on. Right. But with the seven hour video, you can't, you can't do that. Yeah. And you're not required to do that, but it does, encourage you to spend a little bit more time with it. And I was also, you know, also you can't have two people looking at the same, seeing the same moment, unless they are both experiencing the same moment. If, if you and I go to see the video, unless we go there at a, particular time or we see it together then we get to see the same moment but otherwise we see the same thing but not but not the same moment so that also goes back to time and how when you start looking at it then you start seeing it then you start seeing the fidgeting then you start seeing whether the body is more fresh or the body is more tired then you might even see uh, me falling asleep uh, in the middle of it, because there, there is a moment, I don't literally fall asleep, but mm. I'm so sleepy. So maybe then you kind of notice that or you don't, but all those things that make, that make a monotonous life 
that give it, you know what I mean? Then I, you, I just have an image in my head of the next video of you reading Hannah Arendt. <laughs> <laughs> and falling asleep. <laughs> that was, <laughs> I'm sorry, that's just what came to my head. Well, actually, Hannah Arendt is not that boring to read. There, there is, she, I actually kind of, the moments when she really does write poetically. Oh, I think so. I mean, I, I mean, Hannah Arendt was a poet and a poetic writer in my view. Um, in fact, you know, there's, I've, I've begun to sort of develop a sense of the way I read Hannah Arendt, which is she has a lot of, she has sentences or, 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 or fragments that are poetry. And there are paragraphs or sometimes pages connecting those fragments. And the paragraphs and pages are helpful to contextualize and understand the fragments. But what really is meaningful about her are the fragments um, and the poetic crystallizations of, of thought. And so, you, you know, she's a very quotable writer. The quotes can be misunderstood if you don't understand the context and, the, and all the other stuff. But um, in many ways, uh, I read her through trying to make sense of these very um, uh, crystallized thoughts in sort of poetic fragments. And I use the rest of her work to, to, to do that. Um, but some people get caught up in, in, in those other longer paragraphs, and which are also important. Um, which are necessary because it's a philosophical work. It's not a work of, um, of fiction. So That's right. you need um, you need those, and in philosophy, you need those uh, those precise and heavy and maybe not so exciting words. Um, and for me, as I was reading it, I could feel her. I I don't I don't necessarily think that it's that. Anyway, earlier we were talking about a particular work, but even in this one, even as dense and heavy and not so easy to read, it is. I did get moments where I could, I could, I could feel her. I could be like, oh, that's, there you are. And then there'd be moments when I notice myself going away and then moments where I notice myself going, oh, I'm with her again. Um, so, yeah. Well, that's wonderful. Um, I really enjoyed reading RN, you know, in the reading groups with, you and the other people in the Saltoon Gallery. And uh, and I guess we have a, another rest of the year to, to finish it, but yeah. this is exciting. Um, I hope we uh, we get to keep talking about Hannah Arendt. This has been a lot of fun. I hope so too. I'm really happy um, that um, Gavin invited me to take part in this exhibition and that Richard Saltoon is doing this long thing because I would not have read um, Hannah Arendt. I, somewhere she was in the, you must read, but realistically speaking, I don't know if, um, if I would have had this really nice opportunity to kind of be like, okay, you're gonna talk to Roger. Okay, get in there, um, get ready. We're gonna have these discussions. So try to catch up and figure out what's happening. So that was, yeah. It was really I mean, the very, nice to do the that. Very idea, the very idea of a year-long exhibit seems like it's tailor-made for you and, and your interests. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not quick. <laughs> uh, and there's something, I mean, there's something so strange. I don't know how often it happens in the art world that there's a year-long meditation on a, on a thinker. Uh, it can't awesome. be very often. No. Um, so uh, it's really a, a unique experience. And it's also allowing me to talk to you and, and other artists in it on a regular basis, which has been yeah. great for me. So and I think- And I get to be part of it. Yes. So I thank you very much, Lorato. This has been so much fun and really uh, eye-opening for me. So thank you very much. And thank you. This, this was great. Yeah.